today we come to talk about Father's Day. I remember when we were at Mother's Day, I told the mothers, I'll get the guys, just wait, it, it's coming. And today's the day we talk about why fatherhood matters. And it absolutely does matter, more than actually I think we realize. You cannot overstate the importance of fatherhood. It is impossible. If you don't believe that, I did some fresh research this past week about this. According to George Barna, in the last 10 years alone, I can't believe this, in the last 10 years alone in the United States, the number of children in the United States that have gone to bed every night without a father in their home has increased from 33%, don't, can't believe this, to 43%. Don't you think about that. Nearly half of the children that go to sleep every night in the United States go to bed every night without a father in their home. Now there's a law that God put into place. I'm so thankful that there are some laws that, that did not come from Washington, D.C. And there's one of those laws. You shall reap what you sow. I would tell you that I think that most of the problems in the United States today are all taken back, and I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute, can be taken back to the fact that men are sorry at keeping their responsibilities as men. It's easy to father a baby, right? But it's hard to father. And I, I want to talk to you about that from a very straightforward point. If you don't think that fatherhood matters, listen to these statistics. 90% of runaways and homeless children in the United States come from fatherless homes. Think about that. 90%. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists come from fatherless homes. 71% of school dropouts, high school dropouts, come from fatherless homes. And this one just really... Buffaloes me. 85% of youth in prison come from fatherless homes. You think about that. If we could reverse that, if fathers would do what God has called them to do and be the men that God's called them to be, imagine how it could reverse statistics just like this. And again, someone best said it this way It is biologically easy to become a father, but it is biblically challenging and actually, listen to this, to actually father children. Anybody can make a baby, but only a man that loves Jesus, I really believe with all my heart, can be the father that God's called them to be. God needs some men to step up and be the fathers they've been called to be. And in our society today, it's simply not that case. Now, I'm smart enough to know that everyone in this room did not grow up in the home that I grew up in. I get that. I didn't get to pick my home. I was just blessed that I had a father and a mother in my home that loved each other, that loved Jesus and lived their faith out loud. My dad's already in heaven, and one day we'll join him, and my mother's still alive. I'm so thankful for the example they set for me. But I know that when I use the word father in this room, there's some people in this room that had a terrible experience with their dad on this earth. I get that. Or maybe you're perhaps somebody doesn't even know who your father was, or any memory that you have of him, it's just not a positive thing. I get that. I understand completely. But it's important for you to understand, as I say this to you this morning, you have a heavenly father that has never left you. He's never forsaken you. He's been there from day one. He's not going anywhere. There's not one thing you could do to force him to leave you or forsake you. He's not going to do it. You have a heavenly father that is the ultimate example of all things, and he has always been there for you, and he always will be there for you. Amen. So let's talk about this incredible one verse of Scripture this morning that I really do think we can get through this quickly. But let me re begin reading at verse 1 of chapter 6 of Ephesians these words. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Just as we're there, I can't preach this sermon, but if you really want to live longer, honor your mom and your dad. The Bible says you'll actually live a longer life. I don't doubt that at all. Verse 4, these words. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Father, these are your words. I've studied the Bible all of my life, but I could never study it enough to know what to say and to do right now. That's why I rely completely on your Holy Spirit. God, I can't do it, but you can. Fill me with the words that I need to speak, Father. May they be powerful words that come only from you. My prayer today, Father, is that every man in this room that's a father or a grandfather, or maybe praying one day that they might be, that, God, my words would be challenging. But I pray also, God, they'd be encouraging. I pray that every man in this room, Father, would know of the potential that exists in them because of you. 
and that they would realize that full potential, God, as they yield themselves completely to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Reading through this verse of Scripture, the first thing that came to me, the first thing on your outline is a word of caution. There's a word of caution. It says in the first part of the verse, again, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. The word provoke in Greek literally means to rouse to anger, to enrage or to irritate or to embitter. Our job as, as fathers is not to rouse to anger, to enrage, to irritate or to embitter. What are some ways that we actually do that? And I think that every man in this room would have to admit, I am absolutely willing to admit that I've made a lot of mistakes. I hope my family doesn't say amen right now, but I got my family in here. I've made a lot of mistakes as a dad. I know I have. There's a lot of things I could have done better. I've learned from some of those things and gotten better, and I hope I'm always improving in that. But I think every man in this room would have to say there's some mistakes that we've made. What are some of those mistakes we've made as, as, to this idea of provoking our children? Write these down. Number one, excessive overprotection. Excessive overprotection. In the, in the process of raising three daughters, now listen to me, I've, I've raised three daughters and even our dog is a girl. So y'all know I've been in this a little bit. I've learned a few things in being a dad, a lot through observation of other friends that they had that were in and out of our home. We've learned a few things about parenting and how we should do things and maybe how we should not do things. I have known men that have literally made their homes, especially with the little girls, a prison for their daughters. In other words, a boy can't look at them, see them, call them, none of that kind of stuff. I get that. And listen, as a dad of three girls, I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be the guy that followed them around with a gun to make sure nobody looked at them wrong or said the wrong thing to them, did the wrong thing. But I learned in my life that if I were to make my home a prison for my children, one day all they would think about is the day they got to escape that prison. Overprotection. Listen to me, we all want to protect our kids, and there's a point in our lives we have to trust them, and it's hard, it's not easy, it's really hard for guys. Praise God for my wife that held my hand through that. It's hard to watch your children drive away with not you in the car. It's hard to leave them at college and walk away and not know where they are at 24 hours a day. You all want them to stay small where they kind of tuck in at night and you lock all the doors and you make sure there's some bullets in the gun that's in the bedside table if anybody tries to come and harm your children. I get that. But you cannot, as a father, make your home a prison. Way too many men are doing that, and especially, again, with little girls, making as though, listen, it's a hard thing. But one of my best friends said this to me one day. It sounds kind of harsh, but he said, you've never lived your life until you've been at the YMCA with your family and watched grown men check out your 14-year-old daughter walking around the pool. There's some weird people in this world. I get that. But there's a point in life as, as men, we cannot build a prison wall around our children who eventually have to trust them. Overprotection can be a real issue. We have to trust our kids at one point. Excessive overprotection. That's a mistake we all make, perhaps. Number two, extreme overindulgence. Extreme overindulgence. Giving your children everything that they want. Tracy and I know two different people, I will not call their names right now, that we went to college with. And I'll never forget, one of them had a father that was so wealthy and so busy in business that he never ever spent time with his son. He never told his son that he loved him, but he gave him the finest things you can imagine. I remember the day we were riding around in his brand new 1985 GT Mustang. It was red. It was a beautiful car. I, didn't, I couldn't afford it. I had a 1965 Mustang at one time in my life, but it cost $1,900. And you could actually pull the carpet up and see the road. It was like, you know, the Flintstones. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, this thing. You could literally watch the road go by. It wasn't, it was a death trap probably. I had a different kind of Mustang back then, right? We're riding around his car one day, and he had a bag phone in his car. I didn't even know what that was. It was many, many more years before anybody had that. And his phone rings in his car, and he opens this thing, a bag. Y'all remember those? And he says, yeah, Dad. Okay, Dad. He hangs the phone up. We drive across town to what I think back then was Fort, Forest Kate Ford, downtown Chattanooga. Y'all remember that? Forest Kate? Never forget this. We pull in the parking lot. We pull the car up. This car didn't have 5,000 miles on it. He parked the car, went inside. The gentleman drove around a brand spanking new yellow Corvette, and he got out of that car. We got in the Corvette, and we drove off. After 5,000 miles, here's how his dad told him he loved him. Stop by the dealership and get your new car. That one's broken down. It's only got 5,000 miles on it, right? 
I remember another person, I can't call her name right now, but she was also at the Baptist student, you know, with me and Tracy. And I remember a time when she was just talking to me one day and she was just, she, just pouring her heart out. She says, I would give anything if my dad would just tell me that he loves me. I don't remember a day of my life being at my house that my dad did not tell me he loved me. He would say he loved me in front of all of his business associates. He was never embarrassed to say that. She said if, if I could just, my, my, provided a beautiful home. She drove a gorgeous car. She wore the nicest clothes you could get in that day and time. She said, I'd give anything if my dad would just tell me that he loves me. Think about that. When it's all said and done, is it going to matter that you drove the nicest car, had the most beautiful house on the block, and had all the things in the world, and you drove the, the nicest clothes that anyone could ever wear? If you don't know whether your dad loves you? Listen to me. Way too many parents in this room think that you're expressing to your kids you love them because you got them the newest Xbox, or you did this, or you did that. And there's nothing wrong with any of what I've just said to you. But if you're trying to substitute the love that you need to be given to your kids by giving them things, you've made a mistake. In the United States, we are the absolute world's worst at that. Keeping up with the Joneses is everywhere. You can't even have a birthday party today for your child without making sure that everybody that comes to the birthday party gets a gift before they go home. You know why? Because some crazy person came up with that idea. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Whatever happened to it, it's your birthday, people bring gifts to you. Somebody decided years ago that at every wedding, you should, fill a, you should have a five-course meal for everybody that comes there. I don't know who came up with that, but may they rest in peace. I'm, <laughs> I only got one wedding left, but my daughters, and praise God that they did the way they did. They didn't. I tell you what, you can spend a million dollars on a wedding if you want to because you're doing it the way somebody else said it ought to be done. Tracy and I got married. We walked in there. It was a nice cake that someone in her family made. There were some nuts. Y'all remember this? And some mint. Y'all remember those? Come on now. And some punch. If you're hungry, get a lot, right? Yes, and we're not feeding you a five-course meal. Overindulgence. Listen to me. We, our children are spoiled rotten. I'll never forget years ago when the staff at the church said, you know, Phil, we, got, Phil, we just got to. We can't carry flip phones anymore. If I could have a flip phone right now, I'd prefer it. I like those things. They fit in your pocket really great. I don't care about technology. So we go, and we're there. I remember they're handing me this iPhone. I remember saying to the lady, you have no idea what you're giving to me because I won't use half of what this thing can do. And in the same room, there's a man giving his seven-year-old child the newest iPhone. Is that really a good idea? Of course it isn't. But probably their friend at school had one or somebody else has one. So, Daddy, I got to have one, whatever. Listen to me. We can be overprotective of our kids and build a prison around them, and we can overindulge them with things that they don't really necessarily need. You can survive it. My daughters can tell you they survived the fact they never had a television in their room. They never had a computer in their room. It's not, it's not child labor laws or something. You're not breaking any bad law and hating on your children that you don't give them the nicest of everything in the world. Listen to me. Be careful for extreme overindulgence. Another way that we think, I think we do this is outrageous expectations. My daughter Peyton was a really, really good tennis player in middle school and high school. Her only problem was she went to schools that did not have a very good tennis team. Therefore, though she was a really good player, she probably wasn't good enough to be the best player on the other team, but she was on her team. Therefore, from the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth grade, she's playing the very best player on the other team. Y'all know how many matches she won in the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade? One. You know how heart, heartbreaking that was, frustrating it was for me as a dad to take my daughter who cried after every time because she was brokenhearted that she didn't win to help her understand you're going to be better for this. You're going to be better. You're having to play the toughest part of the team. One day we're at the, the park at Tinsley Park here. She's playing a match against Cleveland High School. And I'll never forget, she walks off the court crying. I said, baby, what's the matter? And she said, that parent down there was saying nasty things to me. And I was like, are you kidding me? Y'all know what I did at that moment? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> point him out. So I, I, she wouldn't point out, so I walked up there in front of a whole group of parents and said, Which one of you was talking to my daughter? And nobody went on up to it. After that match, he came to light because that father of the daughter that was playing my daughter 
Walks over, she beat her. I don't think she won a game in the whole match. It starts browbeating his kid that she didn't play better. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So y'all know what I did at that moment? I did not keep my mouth shut. I walked up and I said, sir, this is not Wimbledon. It's high school tennis. His daughter just destroyed my daughter in a match and it just wasn't good enough. Oh, God, forgive us and forgive me for the un unbelievable expectations we put on kids today. Amen. Especially in the sports arena. Especially there. I don't know why. Bethany makes it all the way through middle school with straight A's. They announced, I think, that day that 14 children, when they were graduating from middle school, had kept a straight A average. And I made the mistake of going over to my daughter, who is very competitive, and saying, I bet you can't make it all the, well, all the way through high school doing that, to which she took as a challenge, I guess, because <laughs> then I said, I'll give you $1,000 if you can do it. And the next year I said, well, I'll give you another 1000 And I made a big mistake. <laughs> if y'all met my daughter Bethany you know, she may be the smartest person I ever met in my life but she's not the only one did you know Peyton made straight A's too did you know that Faith just graduated from high school and from her got her what her associate's degree from college all at the same time you think they're yeah you know why they're smart because they have an awesome mom over there my dad I come home from school when I was a kid and my mom she really was Phil you can do better Phil you can do better my dad's like well I didn't do any better I was like yeah dad you're awesome <laughs> <laughs> My mom's watching this right now, and I don't re ever remember making an F, but she always said, Phil always said that F means fine. <laughs> and if it had been up to me, my girls probably wouldn't have been nearly as smart as they are. Tracy gets 100% of the credit for it. But you know what? Sometimes we put unrealistic expectations on our kids. Sometimes it's because we didn't excel in the area we thought we should, and so we put it on them. I wonder how many kids are walking around right now that don't know that their parents love them and are proud of them because all their parents ever say is, can't you do better? How many young boys need their dad to say, I'm just proud of you, son. I see you're working hard, but no. Couldn't you do better? We put unrealistic, outrageous expectations on our kids. Listen to these words. Paul wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. I really love this. We, ex we ex ex exhorted you, <laughs> exhorted you and, con uh, and comforted you. Excuse me. If I can get these tears on my eyes. And comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. I'm 100% in support of expecting great things of your kids, of encouraging great things in your kids, but make sure you balance it with every kid doesn't win the, the gold medal. Sometimes you're playing a better player. Sometimes it's okay to say, I'm proud of you, even though you didn't win first place. And you all know that I'm against everybody getting a trophy. It's that mess today. But make sure you balance expectations with encouragement. You'd be surprised what you could get out of your kid, out of your wife, out of your husband if you just learned how to encourage them. Number four, overwhelming discouragement. Overwhelming discouragement. I'm guilty as a parent. My wife has pointed that out to me several times in my life. of always seeing the negative thing first. Multiple times, even saying things to one of my daughters that wasn't true, I found out that wasn't true. And I remember they always told me that I couldn't sneak up on them because if it was really quiet in here, I could walk across the stage and you could hear my ankles pop. They pop every time I take a step. They said, Dad, we always knew when you were walking in the hall outside checking on us. We always knew you were there. But I distinctly remember times walking up those stairs to apologize to my daughter because I'd been too harsh or perhaps I'd said something that wasn't actually the truth. That's tough. How many kids today are totally and completely discouraged? Not because of what the coach told them at school or their teacher told them at school, but because of what you said to your kids and the way that you treated your kids. It's just not fair. And so there's a lot of discouragement in the world today 
Even depression in the world today because of what dad did and what dad said and what dad did not do in life. Overwhelming discouragement. That's a way to provoke your children. And one last thing, open hypocrisy. Write that down. Open hypocrisy. This may hurt just a little bit, but listen to me. I want you to look at me for just a minute. If you want your child to be an honorable person, be an honorable person, Father. You say, well, I don't want my kids to grow up and be a drunk. Well, then don't be a drunk. I don't want my kids to smoke pot. Well, they don't smoke pot. I don't want my kids to use that foul language. So they don't use that foul language. Your children will grow up to be more like you than any other man on this planet. Not just your boys, but also your girls. Be an example worth following. It is so hypocritical for you to say to your kids, do as I say, not as I do. You can't do that. It's if you want your child to be something, then you be that for them. You show them the way. You, you, you show them the way to that path to be that person they need to be. You be the example worth following in life. Just a word of caution. Then he goes on to a word of command. I don't believe at all the rest of this is a suggestion, but a command. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but he says this. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So write a few things down. Number one, enrich your children. Enrich your children. He uses these words. He says, bring them up. It doesn't say send them off somewhere. It says for you to bring them up. You show them the way. I think back in my mind right now, I miss my dad so much, but I think of all the times I, I remember him showing me something, not telling me something. You with me? I today can do so much around the house because my dad did not just go fix the leaky faucet, but he said, son, come here, watch this. Let me show you this. Eventually, standing over my shoulder and making me do it so I would do it right. Praise God for the things he poured in my life. Simple things like that. I've told you the things in life when one of the things just really comes, I can take you to the house and show you the garage where we were standing and I'm folding an electrical cord over my shoulder, which my son-in-law Jordan's taught me a better way to do that, though I don't really know how to do it. But anyway, I'm folding it over my shoulder the whole bit and, and it was too small. It was just too much of a long cord and I got right to the end of it and it fell off my shoulder onto the floor and just kind of scattered all out. And I remember probably going, oh man, or something like that. And my dad just walked over and he picked up one end of it, didn't say a word, just rolled it over his shoulder, rolled it over his shoulder, rolled it over his shoulder, and finally he got it finished, and he took it, and he put it in its place on the wall in the garage, and he looked at me, and he said something he said a thousand times to me, son, you can't beat an education. You see, what he did was he taught me a lot of things, not just how to roll up a cord, but to have a right attitude, because there's going to be other times in your life when it's not going to go your way, and the cord in some way in life is going to fall off your shoulder. You did not have that planned. And you need to know patience in that moment. You know how many times I've learned from that in the, the, the job that I have? Are you kidding me? Do you know how many times I want to say something, but I can't say what I want to say? Because it would be the wrong thing to do. You see, sometimes when you guys come to me with all your problems, you know what I really want to say to you? Something like, why don't you grow up? Or why don't you read the Bible? Why don't you start praying? I can't do that. i got to just hold your hand and say, yeah, I get it. And why don't I pray for you right now? And don't forget that I'm here for you, right? You know where I learned that? Not in seminary. I learned it from a dad who took the time to show me how to be a man. Enrich your children. It says again, bring them up. That's you, Dad. You do it. Bring them up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29. It's right on the same page of my Bible. Listen to these words. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. <laughs> For this reason we shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. 
One of the parts of enriching your children, this is something I just need to say, the greatest thing that any man ever did for his children is to love his wife. Amen. The greatest thing that any man ever did for his children is out loud in front of the whole world, love his wife. It is so sad. So many men, you know where these men grew up today to be the beast that they are and not the loving husbands they need to be and the guys that are all self-centered and think they're, they've seen that somewhere, haven't they? And it's probably because they were in a fatherless home and now they're in the gang and the gang's teaching them how to be a man. And that is contrary completely to what the scriptures teach to be a man. And so to be a man of God, the greatest thing I can possibly do above everything else. Listen to me, this is more important than making sure I read my Bible every day. I need to make sure that I love my wife out loud in front of my kids. Why? Because they're going to grow up to be more like me than any other man in the world. You bring them up. We don't get them for very long, do we? I'm at this funeral that I had to do for this gentleman that I just mentioned a moment ago. His precious wife, there were three children I've never met in my life. These three little, two little girls and a little boy. And I'm, I'm just playing with the little girls. I'm used to being around them a little bit. And I'm just thinking what life's going to be like for these little children. How difficult that must be. Then I have the privilege maybe to have a dad to show them. Maybe God will take care of all that. I, I understand. How blessed are you, gentlemen, if you have the opportunity to bring them up. You show them the way. Number two, educate your children. <laughs> educate them. He goes on to say this, again in verse four, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction. Discipline and instruction. Education. I'm not talking about make sure they go to an Ivy League school when they go to college. That's not what I'm talking about. This is a different education, right? There's nothing wrong making sure your kids go to a really good school. Please do that. But don't make that a substitute for this. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says this. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. I'm not here to tell you how to do that. There's all kinds of ways to do that. That's not my job to tell you how to do that. But a father that loves his children will instruct and discipline his children. One of the great problems in the world today are, are parents both just saying, you know what, let it be. Just let it be. The hands-off approach. In my life, I've met a parent that was, they built that prison I talked to you about earlier for their first child and found out that didn't work real well. So what did they do? They did the polar opposite with the second child. They say, just let them do whatever they want to do. A kid's going to be a kid, right? No. You bring them up in the instruction and the discipline of the Lord. And so there has to be discipline if there's going to be anything. Someone said it so right when they, they made this comment. Listen to these words out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. All discipline is for the moment. It seems not to be joyful. Amen to that. But it's sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I learned when I was a little boy, I was wrong when I thought that my parents didn't know what they were talking about. I never said that to them because I knew what was coming if I said that to them. But I thought in my mind, you've lost your, you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, they did. The older I got, the more brilliant my parents became, right? Y'all have all been there and your kids are learning the same thing right now. And so those times when my dad said, eat the green beans or, or, or else, I'm glad that I've learned from that, that, you know, my dad wasn't doing that because he didn't love me. He did love me. He was teaching me some discipline in life. And listen to me, every one of us, even as we grow older, still need that discipline now from the Lord to get us to where we need to be. God never disciplined anyone because he didn't love them. He disciplined them because he did indeed love them. You need to hear this. Somebody in this room doesn't understand. Your heavenly father always wants what's best for you. He always does. Sometimes we're numbskulls and we're not listening. And he has to take us through some instruction, some discipline to get us there. Every one of us live learn, learn lessons that way. And some of us are so hard-headed we have to learn every lesson that way. 
for the moment, it may be a painful thing, but ultimately, it gets us to where God wants us to be. You need to hear this. God has you where you are right now, but he has a place he wants you to go. The way he's going to get you there is he's going to discipline you and instruct you to get there. Don't miss that. Number three, evangelize your children. This is so key. He says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I would love to tell you that I have this supernatural ability. You don't need to even talk about Jesus at the house because if they'll just come hear me preach, I got it covered. I wish I could tell you that. I wish I was that good, but I'm not that good. I will make you this promise. If you bring your children to this church, I promise you, if they're Miss Sonia's ministry, they're going to hear about Jesus every single time they come to this church. They will never be babysat. They'll be taught. They'll be instructed. You get them under Miss Jenny's ministry, they're going to hear about Jesus every time they come. You bring them to this student ministry, they're going to have a lot of fun. But I promise you, Eric will make sure they hear about Jesus every single time they come on this campus. You bring them to a worship service here, I will promise you. And you hold me responsible for that to make sure that you, they will absolutely hear about Jesus. This church is here to help you and partner with you to raise your children, absolutely. But we can't be with you all the time. We may get them a couple of we- hours a week. Notice this text doesn't say, take your kids to church and let them evangelize your kids. It doesn't say that. It says you do the job. Listen to the verse one more time. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All we can do is partner with you to help you. And we will do our job, I promise you. As long as they let me be the pastor of this church, I will make sure when they come to this church, they're going to hear about Jesus. But what are they going to do in all those other hours, the 22 hours we don't get to be with them during the week? You have got to be a part of that. Evangelize your kids. This is the most amazing stat I will ever share, probably in any sermon. Listen to these stats. These are true true, um, demographics here. When a child is the first in a family to come to Christ, there's a 3.5% chance the rest of the family will also come to Christ. If the mother is the first to come to Christ, there's a 17% chance that the father and the rest of the children will come to Christ. My friends, there is a 93% chance that when daddy comes to the Lord first, that his family will follow suit. Think about that for a minute. Dads don't really matter, do they? They absolutely matter. Absolutely. I hear these feminists today, we don't need men. Well, maybe the men you're looking at, but we need some fathers and we need some godly men in this world like we've never needed it before. Ever. Praise God for single moms. They're probably the glue and the cement that's holding this nation together today because of sorry, no good men that fathered children and never were responsible for what they fathered. God help us. 93% when a father comes to Christ... The rest of the family will follow suit. You think it's not important? It's little wonder this nation's in the condition it's in today, theologically and certainly uh, immorally and obviously spiritually that it is. And so some words of encouragement. I've beat you up enough. Number one, you want to write these down, men, please do. Number one, there's no perfect father except God. And so throw yourself a little bone because we've all messed up. There's no perfect dad, no perfect mom while we're there. God's the only perfect one. And so we all fall short. That's why we need him so much, right? Which leads to my second word of advice, which is you're never going to be the father that God wants you to be until you submit completely to him and his authority in your life. There it is. You're never going to be worth a dime at being a dad if you try to do it in your own strength. You're never going to do it if you just read a couple of books in the library or you go over to the bookstore and the bestsellers about being. Listen to me. If you don't submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ to guide you and help you, you're never going to be the father that God's called you to be. No perfect God, no, no one perfect but God. And no good dad will ever do it without him. Number three, even though you feel lonely, lonely, even though you feel like you're all by yourself, you're not. I referenced this earlier. I grew up in, a, in this family of mine with these three girls scattered all about themselves and even a girl dog named Zoe who 
tried to die on us the other night and we got halfway to the doctor's office at two o'clock in the morning to say our goodbyes after 16 years and she looked at Tracy and decided that she wasn't ready to go just yet and see she perked up and got all great so y'all pray for Zoe I think she's going to live longer than we are and um, I've lived in a all women home no one said yes ma'am more than I have in the last 30 years I can promise you that You know what? Sometimes that's a lonely place to be. You know, I've found in my life that in places of authority are often the loneliest places. I've pastored some gigantic churches in my life. I'm so thankful to be in a church like this where I can know all of you. But there's been times I've stood and preached to thousands and thousands of people, of which most of which I will never know personally. It's a tough thing to do. It's a lonely job. Sometimes it's lonely at the top. You may disagree with this, and that's okay, because you'll be disagreeing with the Word of God. But the Word of God says that the Father should be the spiritual leader in His home. Amen. A place of leadership many times is a lonely place to be, because you've got to make some tough calls sometimes, right? And sometimes you mess up, and you've got to hone up to that too. And some of you men in this room right now, because maybe you've not heard any encouragement from anybody around you, and maybe you don't deserve any encouragement right now because of the sorry job you're doing as a dad, and maybe I'm doing as a dad. But hear this, please. You may feel lonely, but you're not alone. You're not alone. Your heavenly Father is a whisper away. He's not gone anywhere. He has everything you need to be successful at what He's called you to be, and so maybe you need to just pull closer in that relationship you have with him because he will help you be the dad you need to be. I know it feels lonely. I felt that. I know that. But you're not alone. One last thing. It's never too late to begin the process of becoming a godly dad. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's gone on, the, all the water's gone on the bridge, whatever so far. It's never too late to start. Maybe your kid's already grown. And maybe what you need to do today is sit down and write a letter, make a phone call, make a personal visit to those kids that you weren't the dad you wanted to be to to say, I'm sorry, and going forward it's going to be different. I don't know what needs to happen. Maybe you're that dad that's in the, in the middle of all the, having all the little kids right now, and you know what happens? Kids love their moms. It makes sense, right? Have you ever thought about this? A, a mother grows a baby in her womb, pushes that baby out of her womb, feeds the baby with her body, does it make any sense that they would be kind of close to their mom? Absolutely, right? And what moms don't sometimes understand is that makes us even more lonely sometimes. Sometimes you feel like you're the, the fifth wheel. You're not. And so hear this. Today's a great day to redouble your efforts to be the best dad you can be. This nation's future depends on it as goes the family will go this nation we are reaping what we have sown biggest life in this nation right now you want to see why this nation is falling apart you we can blame washington all you want to you can say we got boneheaded politicians making tough decisions well you know what that's true but i personally believe the reason this nation is in the shape it's in today is because of the father problem we have in this nation which is absentee fathers and even some of those that are present you go to sleep at night with your dad under the roof with you he's not your father he's not being the father he needs to be and so what do you got to do guys what do you need to do today to be in the position you need to be in with God and with your family that's what I believe and why I believe that fatherhood absolutely matters if we could reverse the fatherhood problem in this nation I think we could see revival in this nation, in every single area of life. And it starts with you. And it starts with me. God, I pray for these men in this room. It's a tough word today, Lord, to understand that perhaps the greatest problems that are in our society today are because men were quick to father children, but not see through the responsibility of raising those children. Oh, God, forgive us as a nation. Even as a nation, God, we almost have laws on our books that reward bad behavior. Forgive us for that. How could we not look at this nation, Father, and wonder how we got to the situation where people would think it's okay to kill a baby in the womb 
It makes complete sense, Father, when we throw away everything else in society. I pray, God, for the men that are in this room that have the privilege to be a father, those that are fathers and grandfathers, maybe even great-grandfathers. I pray for those young men that are in this room that one day pray they will be a father, that, God, we would put you first, that we would do everything in our power, Father, to raise our children and not let someone else do it. That we be present in the lives of our children, present in the life of our wives. That there would never be a day that those that are closest to us would not know that they know that they know that they are loved and cared for. Lord, I pray that every man in this room would hear your voice right now. What is it that they need to do, God? What are the changes they need to make? What are the commitments they need to make today to get right in the center of your will in this role, this most important role? of being dad. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do. I pray, Father, for the wives in this room that perhaps have not thought long and hard about their role in helping their husband be the man he needs to be. That, yes, harsh words many times come and criticism comes, but they're never bathed and they're never balanced with encouragement. Oh, God, if the women in this room could just get a grasp of what might happen in the life of their husband if they poured the encouragement on them along with that criticism. Oh, God, help the wives in this room to help their husbands so that, God, the family unit can become exactly what you intended it to be, the bedrock of our society. We love you. We ask you, God, now to do what only you can do. Maybe there's a man in this room that needs Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, trust me, you're never going to be the dad God called you to be. It starts with that relationship. I would count it the greatest privilege in the world to help you with that today. If you were to cry out to him right now and ask him to forgive you of your sin and wash you in the blood of Calvary and to save your soul, I promise you, he would do exactly that. God, move in this moment. I pray, Father, for your encouragement upon these men, but also the challenge of the Holy Spirit to make a move, Father, to make themselves the man they need to be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you...
your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great oh. 